All right, there we go. Let's have a look at this. So we talked about this stuff a little bit on Friday. Some of you weren't here. That's all right. We'll, I think you'll catch up. No biggie. So we want to write the quadratic expression in factor form. So there's, there's a, several different kinds of problems you're going to get, and they all are essentially the same thing. Some questions are going to ask you to do this, which just means factor. You're going to factor that expression. Sometimes I'm going to ask you to solve an equation. Like, for example, this one could have been written like this. Instead, it might have said solve 4x cubed plus 32x squared plus 36x equals 0. Or I might have said find the zeros of this function. They all essentially are going to ask you to do the same stuff. They're all going to ask you to... To, well, to solve this, we're going to have to factor, right? So that we're just going to focus on that part of this problem because that's the hardest part. Once you got it factored, the rest of it is easy. It's just applying the zero product property, so that's no big deal. But we got to get it factored first. So let's talk about that, about the steps we go through to factor stuff. So the first thing we always want to do when we're trying to factor something is see if we can pull out a greatest common factor. See if there's something that we can undistribute from all the terms. That's always going to help. It's always going to make things easier every time. So is there? Yes. Okay, so the number part is 4, isn't it? The greatest common factor of 4 and 32 and 36 is just 4. That's the biggest number that divides evenly into all of those, right? So we can undistribute a 4 from everything. What about the variables? Can we undistribute anything else? We can. What? X cubed. Not an X cubed. Just an X. Okay, why though? Let's talk about why. So think what this means. If we're trying to, to factor out the greatest common factor, the greatest common factor is the biggest thing that's going to divide evenly into all of those, right? So let's show why this works. So if I were to divide the first term, 4X cubed, if I divide that by... 4x by 4x, what do we get? Yeah, the 4s are going to cancel. Well, I'm not going to get x cubed. What's x cubed divided by x to the 1? x squared. How come? Oh, good, because when you divide like bases, you subtract the exponents. Good, so that's going to be x to the 3 minus 1, which is x squared. Good. Okay, so what about the next term? What about 32x squared divided by... 4x. Or 8x. Okay, good. So we know that 32 over 4 gives us 8, and x squared divided by x equals x. x. Okay, so we're left with an 8x. Okay, last one. So what about 36x divided by 4x? 9x. 9. Oh, just 9. Just 9. Yeah, just 9, right, because the x's cancel, and 36 over 4 is 9. Okay, do you see the problem that we would have had if we had tried to divide each of those by, let's say, x cubed, right? Well, I could have divided the first one by x cubed, and they would have just canceled, but what would have happened at the bottom if I had tried that? If I had 36x divided by, say we tried to divide by 4x cubed, well, 36 over 4 is 9, but then x over x cubed negative. is what? x to the negative 2, right? Which puts that x on the bottom. That's not looking good, is it? Right? We don't want that. We don't want to end up with x is on the bottom of our answer. That's not what we're looking for, right? So the best we can do is undistribute an x because that's the biggest power of x that we could divide all three of these by. Right, we're limited by that guy right there. He's only got an x to the 1. So I can't divide that term by anything bigger than x to the 1. Right? Does that make sense? Think in terms of undistributing, too. I could take an x cubed away from that one, or an x squared, or an x. Because it's got x cubed to give. Right? This guy right here, I could not take an x cubed, but I could take an x squared, or an x. I could undistribute that. But this one here only has an x to give away. Right? So the biggest I could do is undistribute a 4x, okay? So what's left when we undistribute a 4x? That's the next question. 
what's left behind? Well, there's a couple ways to think about this. One way, the way I prefer is just to ask yourself, what would I need if I were to distribute, if I were going to undo the factoring out or the undistributing? Say I wanted to redistribute. Well, 4x times what would give me back my 4x cubed? 1x cubed. X X cubed squared, right? Because four numbers, 4x times what is 4x cubed? Well, I already got the 4, but x times what is x cubed? x squared, right? Okay, 4x times what, if I distribute over here, would give me 32x squared. 4 times what is 32? 8, right? And then x times what is x squared? x. Okay. Right. Plus... 4x times what is 36x? Well, I already have the x, but 4 times 9, right? Have you seen those numbers before? Yeah. Right there. Either way, you can think of it either way. If I want to find out what's left over, I can just divide each of the original terms by the greatest common factor, like we did here. That's fine. Or I could play that little game, the little distributing game. And just ask yourself, 4x times what gives me that term, right? I, I do it this way, but either way is fine, okay? That's the answer. Okay, maybe. So we've, we've gone, we've done step one, which is we've, we've pulled out a greatest common factor. Now step two is going to be, can we break apart this part right here? So that's what we would call, and you tell me why. That's something that we could call a quadratic. trinomial. What's the quadratic part? Oh, there's the, oh, yeah, yeah. the square. Okay, and all we're looking at now is just this part right here. Right, so we already took care of that 4x. That factor is already taken out. So at this point, think what we've got. We undistributed a 4x, and so instead of having three terms up here, we've now broken it apart into two factors. One little guy out front, the 4x, and then this other factor that's a lot bigger. It's a quadratic trinomial factor. It's quadratic, how come? X squared. X squared, because it's got an X squared in it, right? So the quadratic part <coughs> is because of that term. What's, what's a trinomial? How come it's a trinomial? What does tri mean? Three. three. So it's trinomial. We've got one, two, three terms in it, right? So we want to see if we can break that apart like we did on Friday, right? Now think about this one. Let's think of our strategy here. If we're just focusing on the white quadratic trinomial, that's our other factor. What's A equal to for that, that factor? One. A is one, B is eight, C is nine, right? Okay, AX, AX squared plus BX plus C. So when A is one, we know that if it factors, it factors easily. It breaks apart into a template like this, and what has to go there and there? If I'm going to, oh, X. X does, right? Because if I were to undo the factoring and multiply this out, when I distribute X times X, I'm going to get my X squared, right? The question is just, what are the magic numbers going to be? Now, remember, we also have that 4X out front that's already done. And I can put it in parentheses if I want to, but I don't really need to, right? Okay, so the magic numbers. Let's focus on the magic numbers here. So when we're looking for magic numbers, my magic numbers, we'll call them N1 and N2, right? So what do they have to, now what do they have to do? If A is 1 and B is 8 and C is 9, what does the product of N1 times N2 have to equal? Not 8. 9. And the sum n1 plus n2 has to equal 8. Okay, and so then we're just going to make that table. And don't skip the table. The table is really helpful. If you, if you don't get the numbers right away, if you make the table, you'll get them. So remember how our table looked. We had a column for n1, we had a column for n2, and we had a column for n1 plus n2, right? So we want numbers that multiply to positive 9 and add to positive 8. So what are the signs that the number is going to be? If they, if they multiply to a positive and add to a positive. 
Okay, but if they're adding to a positive, they're, they gotta be positive, right? Okay, so we know that we could just put plus signs there, right? And so we wanna find numbers that multiply to nine, and we'll see what they add up to. Well, one times nine, one plus nine is 10, right? What's the only other possibility for numbers that integers that multiply to nine? Three and three. And that adds to six. Did we get eight anywhere? No. So what's that mean? There's no solution. It doesn't, well, I wouldn't say there's no solution. It doesn't factor any further. So our answer was, this step right here is our answer. That's as much as we can do, right? We can't go any further. We've just got 4x times this other big factor, but the other one won't split apart any further. We split it apart, we split it apart as far as we could, and that's where we have to stop. Now, if we were solving this, you know, that would be a little bit of help. So our answer, let's, you know, let me write the answer up here. So our answer is something like, oh, I'll write it right here. So our answer is equal to 4x times x squared plus 8x plus 9. That's our answer. Okay. If this all was set equal to 0, what would happen? Well, we, we'd know what the value of this solution would be. By the zero product property, the product of that factor and that factor could only equal zero when either one of them is zero, right? So either 4x equals zero, which would make x zero, would we agree? Okay. Or this would equal zero and we're stuck. We weren't able to factor it. So when we get back after Christmas break, we'll look at some ways that if something doesn't factor, we could still find solutions, right? We could still set it equal to zero and find solutions, even without factoring it, okay? But we're not quite there yet. All right, let's try another one like this. Slightly different wording here, but the same idea. Okay, this one's maybe a little bit easier though, right? So use factoring in the zero product property to find all real zeros of this quadratic function. Well, what does it mean to be a zero of a function? And, and zero is a really important word. What are we setting equal to zero if we're finding the zeros of a function? X. Not x, the function, right? We want to know where y is equal to zero, where it's crossing. If we were to graph the function, right? A quadratic function is just a parabola, agreed? Mm -hmm. Right, so we know that it's gonna look maybe something like this, right? So the zeros are gonna be the places right there and right there where y is equal to zero. And y is just f of x, isn't it, right? f of x is just a fancy name for y. So we're gonna set, we're gonna set f of x equal to zero, and that's the equation that we're gonna solve, right? Whatever we get when we set the function equal to zero, that's the equation that we're solving to find the solutions, right? Okay, so how are we gonna do that? So we've got x squared, plus 5x minus 50 equals 0. Okay, so this is what we talked about on Friday, right? It's not practical for us to just try to find the solutions that are going to magically make all this stuff add up to 0. What we have to do is use the zero product property. We've got to break it into factors, and then the factors, like if I have a times b equals 0, what's the only way that can happen? Either A is zero or B is zero, right? So if I can split this apart into a product of factors, the factors are going to be little. They're not going to be quadratic, uh, quadratic expressions. They're going to be linear expressions, no x squared in them. So they're easy to solve, right? So that's our goal. Can we split this thing apart? Well, what's A equal to in this case? One. So this is easy. If A is equal to one, we know that our if it factors, it's got to fit that pattern, doesn't it? Right? Only thing we have to do is just find our magic numbers. Right? So what do our magic numbers have to do here? N1 times N2 has to equal what? Negative 50. Negative 50, right? Whatever C is. And N1 plus N2 has to equal 5. So then all we have to do here is just make a, make a table
And let's see. What about the signs? If they multiply to a negative, what does that tell us? One, one, they have the opposite signs, don't they? The only way two numbers can multiply to a negative is if one is positive and one is negative. They have opposite signs. So one's negative, one's positive. If they're adding to a positive, which is the bigger of the two? The positive has to be, right? Because if I, like, what about eight and negative three? If I add those up, I'm going to get positive five because eight is bigger than the negative one, right? Yeah. But if it was negative eight and positive three, they would have added to negative five, right? Okay, so we know that we're going to get the bigger of the two is positive. And so we'll just make a list like that. We want factors of negative 50 where the positive factor is the bigger. So we could do something like negative 1 times 50 is, that adds up to what, 49? Too big. I could do negative 2 and 25. Still too big, negative 23. What's next? Um, 3 doesn't go in, 4 doesn't go into 55 does though, right? So negative 5 and 10, what's that add up to? Negative 50. It adds to 5, doesn't it? Which is what we want, right? Right? So they, it, all these multiply to negative 50. That's why we're choosing these, right? These are factors of negative 50, but this is the one that wins. Because that's the one that adds to 5, right? So those are our magic numbers. So we're going to get x plus 10 and x minus 5, right? And once we get that, we're done. Now, by the zero product property, I know that the left factor times the right factor can only equal zero when either the left factor equals zero. What would that be? What value of x makes that zero? Negative 10. So that's one thing. Or the right factor equals zero. Five. Or five. Good. Okay. See? No big deal. Right? That's what we did on Friday. Okay, so now the next step, and this is not, this isn't part. The next step is just to expand this a little bit. So what about, what happens in a situation like this? Why is this different? This would be considered a harder problem. How come? Well, I mean, even if, okay, we could try to factor out a greatest common factor. But we can't take out any x, right? Because this, this term doesn't have an x in it, so we can't undistribute an x. Is there any number that divides into both 18, 21, and 4? No, 1. 1, but 1 doesn't help us, right? We're looking for a greatest common factor other than 1. So we can't do anything with that, but then something about this is a lot different. There's no x in the negative. Yeah, but I mean, it wasn't on this last one either, but something was different here. This was a lot easier when we factored this one. How come? Uh, the x squared was by itself. A was equal to 1, right? Question? Can I go to the Yeah, you bet. Right, so, so A was equal to 1, and that made it simple, right? In this case, the difference is here, right? The difference is that's not 1, right? So that makes things a little tougher. So what's our strategy when we're trying to factor something that Factor a quadratic trinomial like this where A is not equal to 1. Okay, there's a way to do this. Do you guys remember bottoms up? Raise your hand if you ever learned bottoms up. Okay, raise your hand if you remember bottoms up. Kind of, maybe, sort of. Okay, let's, let's run through bottoms up. Bottoms up is not hard. Bottoms up makes this really pretty easy. So don't be, don't be intimidated by this. This is not a big deal. Here are the steps for bottoms up. Let's just step through these. I'm going to color code these so you can follow the steps, right? Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find magic numbers just like before, but the magic numbers, there's a little bit of a difference. We're not finding numbers that multiply to, I'm not supposed to say add to be. Okay, i got to fix that. That's going to mess you up. And add to be. So the numbers have to multiply not just to C, but they have to multiply to the product of A and C. Whatever that is. Honestly, that's what we did last time, too, but we didn't notice. How come? Last time we said they just had to multiply to negative 50. We said they had to multiply to C. But what was A? 1. What's 1 times negative 50? Negative, negative 50. So really, it was A times C, but because A was equal to 1, we didn't really need to worry about the A, right? So now that A is not equal to 1, we do have to worry about it. 
So we've got to find magic numbers that multiply to A times C. So first of all, what is A times C? A times C, 18 times negative 4. What is that? Negative something. What? 18 times 4. 18 times 4. You can either just double 18 and then redouble it, or you can multiply, you know, you could multiply. Uh, 72. Yeah, so if we're going right, to multiply this times 4, we could just multiply 10 times 4 and then 8 times 4 and add them up. I don't care. They're both about equally. What do you get? 76. 70, 76. Not 76. What do you get, Landon? 18 times 4. 72. So double 18 is 36, right? It's 36 double. What is it? 72, there you go. Okay, so A times C is negative 72. What's B? That's the same as always. What's B? Hey, everybody up here. I need you up here. Jonathan, close that up, please. What, what's B? Negative 21. Okay, so we got to find numbers that multiply to the product of A and C. So you're going to multiply to negative 72 and add to B, which is negative 21, right? So let's find those magic numbers. So n1 times n2 equals negative 72. n1 plus n2 equals negative 21. So let's just make one of our tables. n1, n2, and then the sum of n1 plus n2. OK, what about the signs? Let's think about this. If they're going to multiply to a negative, What's that tell you about the signs? Same or opposite? Opposite. Opposite. And if the if the sum is negative 21, which is bigger? The negative. Negative has to be bigger. So we want to take products of a small positive and a bigger negative to equal negative 72, right? So we could do like 1 times negative 72. What's that add up to? Negative 71. Negative 71. So that one doesn't fit, right? They multiply to negative 72, but they add to be something too big, right? So we got to get closer together. Well, we could do 2 times negative what? 36. And what's that going to give us? 34. Negative 34, still too big. Does 3 go into 72? I don't know. It has to, because 7 plus 2 is 9, which is divisible by 3, right? So we know it does. So 3 times what? I think I heard it. Negative 24. Negative 24. Yeah, so that's it. That's it, isn't it? 3 plus negative 24 is negative 21, so that's the winner. All right? Everybody see that? Okay, so that's step one. We just got to, just like before, we got to find our magic numbers. We found them. Okay, step two. Step two is just like before with one small difference. Okay, so look at step two here. That's going to be our yellow step. So we end up with... We're going to create our template just like before where we have an x and an x, and we're going to add these numbers to x just like before. So we get x plus 3 and x minus 24. But here's the part that's different. Uh, we're going to add each magic number to x, but we have to divide each one by a. So each magic number, 3 and negative 24, they have to be divided by a. What's A? 18. 18. So they're going to get divided by 18, right? Okay, so there's step two. Just like before, combine the magic numbers with X, but each magic number has to get divided by A. They were before also, but it didn't matter before because A was 1. So dividing by 1 didn't change anything, right? Okay, so now next step. Reduce the fractions if you can. Okay, so what's this going to become? So x plus, what is 3 eighteenths reduced to? 6 or 1 6. 1 6. So that reduces to x plus 1 6. And over here we get x minus, what about 24 over 18? What's the biggest thing that's going to divide into both? Uh, negative 6. So, well, 6 will, right? So that's going to make the 6 times 4 is 24 and 6 times 3 is 18. Right? So we're just going to get x minus 4 thirds. Can we pause there? Questions? All we did was just simplify or reduce the fractions. 
And then the last step, we're done. The last step is bottoms up. So what does bottoms up mean? It means if there is a number in the bottom, meaning in the denominator, when after we simplify it, if there's a number in the bottom, it goes up front, in front of the x. That's it. So this first factor becomes 6x plus 1. What's this one going to become? 3x minus 4. Yeah, this becomes 3x minus 4, and we're done. That's it. The factor. That's the answer. That's it. That's not so bad, is it? I mean, that's almost the same process you went through. You found magic numbers just like before. One difference, though, is they have to multiply to the product of A and C, right? So sometimes the numbers get a little bit bigger when you're doing this kind of a problem. And so they are a little bit harder because you have sometimes a little bigger numbers to deal with. But after that, nothing really was that bad, right? Once we find the magic numbers, we just make our templates just like before, only we have to divide the magic numbers by A, reduce the fractions, and go bottoms up, and we're done. Okay, so try one. How much time we got? We have time. So try... Let's try this one. Okay. So we're going to find the zeros of this, right? So we're just going to set the, here's the equation we're going to get. We're going to set the function equal to zero, and we're going to solve. But the way we're going to solve is by factoring. Can I take out a, a greatest common factor? No. No, 13 is no. prime, right? Yeah. And there's no x there, so I can't. So I'm stuck. So what do my magic numbers have to multiply to here? Uh, one e and two. Yeah. N1 times N2 equals 40. 40, right? Everybody see that? Because A times C, 20 times 2 equals 40. So that comes from these two, right? Okay, and they have to add to what? 13. Yeah, they add to 13. Okay, so we just have to find numbers that multiply to positive 40 and add to 13. Well, what are those? I bet you can think of them right now. What numbers multiply to positive 40 and add to positive 13? Uh, we can make a table, too. Four no? Close. What's five and eight. That's it. Got them. Right? Does that make sense? I mean, they're both positive, aren't they? So if we tried, I mean, like, if we tried something like, say we started with 20 and 2. I should get some more batteries. Those add up to 22. That's too big. Remember what we said on Friday. If, if they add to a number that's too big, it means the numbers are too far apart. As the numbers get closer together, their sum gets smaller. 22 is too big, so i got to move my numbers closer together. So I could do 4 and 10, and that's going to give me 14, but I need 13, so we're close. They have to get a little bit closer together. 5 and 8. Well, that's 5 and 8. right? So there's our winner. Okay, so now what? What's my... Divide by A. Okay, so I'm going to set up my template with those numbers, right? X plus 5 times X plus 8. And what do they get divided by? 20. 20, right? Because that's A. Everybody see that? So they get divided by 20. So now what? X what? Reduce the fraction. Okay, good. Reduce fractions. So this becomes X plus what? One, One fourth. fourth. And X plus uh, two, fifths. two fifths. Yeah. Four goes into eight two times, goes into 25 times. So what's my answer then? We're done. Uh, four X plus one. Yeah. We just go bottoms up, right? If there's something on the bottom, it goes up to the front. 4x plus 1 times 5x plus 2. 5x plus 2, we're done. How about that? And then if I were trying to solve this, okay, I want to make one more point. And then we're done with this. So our whole point here was we're trying to solve this thing, right? So it's set equal to 0. Everybody agree? Yep. Okay, so then this whole thing is set equal to 0. Did we even have to do this last step before trying to solve the equation? No. We didn't. In fact, we don't. it's probably good not to. I don't need to do that because right here, I've got enough information to be done. By the zero product property, Caleb, you tell me. I've got two factors, the product of the left and the right equals zero, right? 
So that means that either the left factor is zero or the right factor is zero. What's going to be the value of x that's going to make x plus one fourth equal zero? Not, what is it? Negative one fourth. Negative one fourth. Good. See, so I don't I don't need to do bottoms up, do I? I get x equals negative one fourth. Or what's going to be the value of x here? X plus two fifths equals zero. What would x have to be? Negative two fifths. Negative two fifths. You see, so there's really no point in even doing the bottoms up part. We can just stop right there if we're just trying to find zero. Okay, see that? Yeah. Okay. Wow, that's a lot for a Monday. Uh,